Hi guys, it's Barnaby for Spurred On and welcome to your Monday, regular Monday edition of Five Things We Learn. And this week it is the five things that I feel we've learnt from the Borussia Dortmund and Aston Villa games. I'm actually only going to talk about one thing from the Dortmund game because... Let's face it, Poch uh, waved the white flag a little bit. He played the reserve team and uh, it was all to do with getting the result yesterday against Aston Villa, which we did. So to some degree, I think last Thursday has been forgotten a little bit. Uh, but anyway, the first thing I want to talk about uh, that I feel like we've learned is that we are not top level yet. For me, a club that can be deemed to be top level is someone, uh, a club that can go into a game like that away at Borussia Dortmund, play some squad depth players, some squad members, and still come away with a decent result. When it comes to it, you know, we played a central midfield of Ryan Mason and Tom Carroll on Thursday night, and they were just found wanting. I like them both as squad players. I like them when they come in individually around a spine of stronger players, but when it comes to it, are they ever going to be top-level central midfielders in Europe? No, they're not. Now, what I'm not saying is that Tottenham can never be top level. In fact, what I think is if we'd played our first team against Borussia Dortmund away, it would have been a, a very tight game. It could have been maybe 2-1 to them at a push, 3-1 to them. But I do think we'd have gotten away goal. So in terms of our first 11, maybe even our first 12, 13, 14 best players, I think we are really growing into a great side. However, when it comes to it, like it was proven in the 3-0 defeat at the Westfalen Stadion, we were just really left behind by a Borussia Dortmund team who have shown, I think, in that game, really, how far they've come, how long they've been playing together. Yes, they had a bit of a poor season last season under Jurgen Klopp uh, in his final season there, but really they've been playing that style and playing in that way for five, six years together now. And, uh, and together is a big word because uh, those players have kind of grown together. And I think what Dortmund are doing now is something we can aspire to do season after season. Have a style of play, that real high pressing, high tempo, getting men around the ball, winning it and then in transition breaking on, on the opposition uh, like we've been doing under Poch this season. And we can look forward to doing that over the next four, five, six years with a team who's growing together just as Dortmund have done and hopefully we can produce some glory, glory nights in Europe in the Champions League uh, starting next season just as Borussia Dortmund have had over the last few years. So that was my first point really, just that we're not quite at the top level yet but we are growing towards that. My second point today that I feel like we've learnt, although I do think we knew this already, uh, is that to me it is all about the midfield three of Eric Dyer, Moussa Dembele and Deli Ali. There's a stat that's going round that is an amazing stat, that's when all three of those players have been on the pitch together for longer than 45 minutes this season, we have been unbeaten. And to me you can add in Hugo Lloris to that and Harry Kane, the absolute spine of the side. Obviously, I don't want to forget about Toby Alderweireld, who's possibly been our greatest signing in the last uh, five or six years. But it's all about how things have changed in that fulcrum of the side, in the spine, and uh, just the defensive change in our team this season is unbelievable. I think uh, after 30 games, we've conceded something like 20, 25 less goals than we had at the same point last season, and we came fifth last season. It just shows how far we've come. And for that, I'm not just going to thank Toby Alderweireld, an incredible signing, possibly the best defender in the Premier League, one of the best five defenders in Europe. But I'm going to thank Eric Dyer for not only agreeing to fill in as a, as a defensive midfielder, because let's face it, he wasn't bought as that. In fact, last season he was playing right fullback a lot more than he was uh, in central midfield. It just shows what a brilliantly talented football brain he has, that he can be so versatile. He can fit in at defensive midfield from the first game of the season and almost become the mainstay of our team. In fact, to the point where now with him on a eight or nine bookings or whatever it is, we're all so scared of the day he picks up that booking and has a two-match ban because he's that vital to the team. Similar with Deli Ali, he scored some vital goals. He's got eight assists. And when he plays, a lot of people were saying he wasn't 100% yesterday. But the reason you have a player on the pitch, even if they're not at full 100% like Deli Ali, is because he can produce moments of magic. And yesterday, despite not being at his best, two assists, the chip forward for Harry Kane was such brilliant quick finch, uh, uh, thinking, such amazing improvisation. That, that broke the deadlock and really uh, started the game rolling for us. Even though we'd hit the post and the bar before then, it's about doing things that other players can't do. And that's Deli Alley all over. What a fantastic signing for five million. Absolutely unbelievable. And then Moussa Dembele, who's one of the other members of the three uh, who haven't been beaten when they've all played 45 minutes together. 
he has just grown and grown and grown under Pochettino. Let's face it, there are lots of people in the summer saying maybe he's one of the players who could be sold, but Pochettino, despite not playing him all the time last season, obviously gave him the confidence and said to him, if you play your best and you're more direct and more forward rather than going sideways and backwards with your strength, then you can become one of the best midfielders in the country. And let's face it, there isn't a team in the league right now who wouldn't have him in their team sheet, possibly first name on the team sheet, because he is unbelievably strong. You can't get him off the ball and you just kind of really want him in those big games, all those games where you need victories, of which, of course, we've got eight more. OK, so my third point today in the five things that I feel we've learnt is that Harry Kane, to me, is the heir apparent to Alan Shearer. I'm talking about Alan Shearer, one of the best goal scorers in the history of English football. I'm talking about a player who for 10, 12, 13 years was at the very, very top level. Defenders were absolutely frightened of playing against him. He had strength, he had an unbelievable shot, composure. He was absolutely ruthless when it came to scoring goals. And yesterday, Harry Kane showed me, not that I hadn't known it before or thought it before, just how incredibly Shearer-like he is. And to me, I think that's why Alan Shearer is constantly tweeting about Harry Kane and constantly like uh, shooing away the naysayers about Harry Kane being a one-season wonder or something because Alan Shearer knows a player when he sees one. And Kane has got all that stuff that Shearer had. He is strong as an ox. He's quicker than you give him credit for. No, he's not like, you know, rapier-like pace, but he is absolutely powerful running, running and, and, and holds people off with his, with his arms incredibly well like he did for that first goal yesterday. And he's a top finisher and composed and he can do it under pressure as well. His penalty taking this year, some people have for some reason been saying that the fact he scored five or six penalties is a bad thing. It just shows that under pressure, when the pressure's on, he can do it as well. He will score goals for England time and time again and he's already up to what, 22, 23 goals this season, 17 in the Premier League. Uh, where he's now joint top with Jamie Vardy. The player is just going to go from strength to strength. I think he's only just reached his 23rd birthday. He scored 43 in 75 games for Spurs overall. If he stays at the club, and I don't see why he wouldn't uh, over the years, he could become the highest goal scorer this club has ever seen. And he could get close to that Rooney uh, high goal scoring mark for England as well if he's given the chance to play in that uh, one up top role on his own with some of the other talents that England have got around him. So to me, like I said, Harry Kane is Alan Shearer's heir apparent. My fourth point today in the five things that I felt we learned from the Dortmund and Villa games uh, is about Kyle Walker and Danny Rose, in my opinion, now reaffirming their roles and their places as our first choice fullbacks. Uh, ben Davis and Kieran Trippi have had great seasons, I think, and have really pushed Danny Rose and Kyle Walker on. In fact, I think only about four or five games ago when Kieran Trippier scored that winner against Watford, there were a lot of people talking about, is Kieran Trippier better than Kyle Walker? Should he be in the team? But in my opinion, and it is only opinion, Kyle Walker and Danny Rose just offer us a, a lot more, or, or more, maybe not a lot more, but more in terms of going forward and coming back. Now, I know what a lot of people would, uh, will say, uh, Kieran Trippier is a better crosser of the ball than Kyle Walker. And I agree with that. And in the games where I think... Uh, we're going to be at home and we're going to be up the pitch uh, with 11 men against us behind the ball, a team who's set up incredibly defensively. I would potentially have Kieran Trippier on the pitch there because his delivery of a football into the box is fantastic and that will make a lot, of, a lot of chances for Harry Kane. However, I've noticed in the last two or three games that Danny Rose and Kyle Walker haven't been crossing quite as badly as they had done before and I think they've kind of been doing some work on when they're beating their fullback, when they're getting to the byline, actually cutting it back more than trying to kind of curl an aerial ball into the box, which I don't think either of them are that good at. Yesterday, both Rose and Walker cut a few back that made chances for our strikers and for Eric Lamella. And that seemed to me something like uh, that has been done on the training ground. And I think they're better at that. I think they're more comfortable cutting it back along the ground. So long may it continue, because yesterday, Carl Walker looked absolutely brilliant getting forward. He had the beating of that fullback Sissoko every single time. And uh, like I said, both of them played really well. And I just think, in terms of when the big games come along, and of course we've got Liverpool and Man United coming after the Bournemouth game, we need them in terms of their pace and their power, both going forward and coming back. And that's to me, for me, why they've reaffirmed their place as the top two fullbacks. But I don't want to say anything bad about Davis and Trippier because they've had fantastic seasons and will continue to play games as and when Rose and Walker need to be rested. For instance, against Borussia Dortmund this Thursday night. My final point in the five things that I feel we've learned from the uh, uh, Borussia Dortmund and Aston Villa games 
is about Kevin Vimmer. And I think I've pretty much talked about Kevin Vimmer every single five things episode since he's, he's come into the team. I just want to say that since Jan Vertonghen uh, got injured, uh, we've played seven Premier League games. Uh, Kevin Vimmer has come in for all of them. We've only conceded five goals. Now, for a player who hadn't really played in the Premier League before then, I don't think he'd started a single Premier League game before then, he's a foreigner who's come in, and none of us had seen a great deal of him, apart from in the Europa League games. I think we've just got to say what a brilliant, brilliant signing he's been. And how composed is he, and how well done has he done to actually settle in that quickly? Now, some people might say, oh, well, playing alongside Toby Alderweireld is easy. Toby Alderweireld is a fantastic player and a great leader, great communicator, but Kevin Vimmer still has to have the natural ability and reading of the game that he does. And as well as reading the game well, because he's not blessed with pace to get himself out of trouble, he also keeps it simple, one or two touch. And also his recovery, mental recovery is good, because early on in yesterday's game, he played one bad pass as he's trying to get it out to Danny Rose on the wing. It led to a, a potential counter-attack from Aston Villa, but he didn't let it phase him. And after that, he was absolutely fantastic all game. And he has been every single game. Good in the air, powerful, good passer of the football, keeps it easy, doesn't try to do anything that he isn't able to do. Now, if you were to compare him to, say, someone like a Eunice Kabul, and I don't even mean Eunice Kabul last year. I mean, Eunice Kabul, when he first came to Spurs, he was a centre-back with all those attributes, but his mentality wasn't there. He was desperate to try and beat a man. He was desperate to try and do a worldy pass. Kevin Vimmer doesn't try any of that. And I think he's learned that off Toby Alderweireld, who is just a natural defender. He knows when to get it out, and he knows when to spray a good pass. Again, another comparison, Kevin Vimmer compared to Vlad Karikas when he came in last year. He was so desperate to prove how good he was that he would try and beat players in his own box and dribble the ball out of defence. And sometimes you just don't want that. You just want defenders to defend. And that's what Kevin Vimmer does. And that's what I think Toby Alderweireld is teaching this team to do. And long may it continue because so far defensively it's been an unbelievable season. Think how much happier Hugo Lloris must be this year than last year when we've conceded about 25 goals less in the same amount of games. Anyway guys, that's been the five things that I feel we've learned from the Borussia Dortmund and Aston Villa games. Let me know what you thought of those comments, what you feel like we might have learned in the comment section below. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at SpurredOnTV. Come on you Spurs. Hey, Smithy from Soccer M, back on Spurred On. My video today, I'm going to look at top five Spurs geezers 